The Blind Spot by Leon Creer in Architectural Design, Volume 48, Number 4, 1978. Never before have so many people, so many professional bodies, institutions, magazines, so many papers concerned themselves with architecture. Never has there existed such a plethora of schools and professionals who ostentatiously carried architecture on their coat of arms. Never has there existed so many students, teachers and historians of architecture, and yet architecture seems not only something badly defined, far from agreed upon, but most of these people do not know what architecture is, let alone what it was made of. Not being sure what it should be, some pretend it is dead, while others claim it should be dead. If you look for contemporary definitions, you will find thousands of books on modern architectural subjects. However, only a few would come anywhere near a definition of modern architecture. In this state of confusion, it is only natural that the RABA's architectural library is selling some of its precious content and, for the past few years, been more interested in acquiring books on rules governing daylighting and such subjects rather than on architecture. The confusion becomes complete if you look into Pevsner's Dictionary of Architecture only to find out that the term architecture is not even mentioned. Thus, architecture is veiled in a cloud of nonsense. How can a dictionary treat a subject which does not even enter its own intelligence? We will therefore have to rely on other definitions for enlightenment. Catramer de Quincy devoted to this subject, architecture, about 30 pages of his dictionary and defines it as an imitative system of building, as the art of building, leaving aside its manual aspects. But if architecture is essentially an intellectual discipline, it cannot or does not want at no moment to free itself from its subject and origin, building. Thus, architecture consists essentially of a body of knowledge concerning the material transformation of nature into buildings and in turn the translation of an imitative system of building into an art of building. According to this definition of architecture, this particular art is not only dead, but it is also etymologically absurd to use the term modern architecture, let alone postmodern architecture. If we look at the architectural schools, into architectural offices, into the statutes of professional bodies, we find that not one is occupied or even concerned with the circulation of knowledge about the nature and making of architecture. Architecture depends on function, durability, order, humanity, nature and beauty. Modern architecture has none of these things, Quinlan Terry wrote. The iconographic and symbolic emptiness of modern architecture can of course be explained by the fact that it never belonged to architecture. Rather, it belongs to packaging, and, in its most ambitious examples, it might have been an art of packaging. Modern architecture did not belong to building. Having its roots in the artisan disciplines, building as a culture was circulated through history by collective memory, to be destroyed only by the industrial division of labor and compulsory popular education, or rather, re-education. Architecture and building have disappeared as intellectual and artisan cultures. While European cities are mercilessly wrecked by the brutal construction of the new territorial infrastructures of the advanced industrialized state, the architectural profession has entered a crisis which, since 1968, nobody has been able to escape. After the darkest and most destructive period of European urban history, including the two world wars, the building crisis leaves us today to contemplate the damage which has been caused to the cities and the countryside. If we do not see any major change in the future, it will be because all major political, economical and cultural positions are still occupied by a generation that considered the city and the territory as a field of endless experiments.
We have to deal here with a generation of people who, in the past 30 or 40 years of their professional life, change their styles more often than their ties. This wild profusion of manners is being applauded by journalists as postmodernism and promoted under the motto of complexity and contradiction. It would be naive to see in the new interest in architecture a necessary sign of its revival. The only characteristic that most recent experiments have in common is their fragmentary nature and provocative eclecticism, which, as never before, juxtaposes styles upon styles in most vulgar and raucous way, resulting, in most cases, in nothing but kitsch. And it is kitsch which must be identified as the most important general cultural phenomenon of the industrial age, as the real zeitgeist of the machine age, pervading all levels of life and culture. Any revival of architecture and building culture which is only concerned with the artistic form and which ignores the necessary manual, as opposed to industrial culture of architecture's origin and production, can only trivialize and further marginalize the object which was once man's most important concern. Architecture and building, which once promised the ultimate shelter for man against afflictions of nature, is reduced to a mere problem of packaging and industrial gadgetry. However, to the emptiness of the machine age, one has to respond with a soothing and mildly intoxicating decor, and I wouldn't make too much difference between neo-rococo or neo-cubist. Kitsch is no style, and it is all styles at once. It is ugly, but the function of kitsch is not to be beautiful, but to stand for beauty, to replace beauty, to signify a status. The elusive signification of a social status and the very frustration of what it promises are the central functions of the kitsch object. Instead of satisfying the senses, it merely satisfies an instinct for beauty and social position. Thus, kitsch is fulfilling its economical function to increase consumption and ease production. The delaying of satisfaction and the necessary frustration which occurs with the kitsch object is a necessary basis for the apparently unceasing cycle of industrial production and consumption. The frustration caused by this necessary superficial consumption is only relieved by a ritualized chain of trivial improvements. Nothing can be expected of the official institutions. A reformation of architecture can only happen slowly, supported by a revival of craftsmanship as part of an anti-industrial resistance. According to Adam Smith, ignorance is the mother of industry. Industrial division of labor results in extreme alienation of the work process. The resulting stultification of the worker has so far prevented, and will continue to prevent in the future, the emergence of any proletarian culture. The existential misery of this class will lead it to resist less and less to its total exploitation for production and uncritical consumption. On the other hand, industrial division of labor and the end of the artisan culture of building has degraded architectural work to no more than intellectual speculation. Because craftsmanship is the very basis for any culture, intellectual or manual, the destruction of craftsmanship means effectively the destruction of humanity. Industrial production, far from fulfilling its promise of liberating mankind, is only perpetuating in a more radical and inescapable form man's enslavement in stultifying labor. If the world is to contain a public space, it cannot be erected for one generation and planned for the living only. It must transcend the lifespan of mortal man. Without this transcendence into a potential earthly immortality, no politics, strictly speaking, no common world and no public realm is possible. The city of stone became, to the prophets of total mobility, synonymous with death, inflexibility or even laziness. 
a built and protected world which took many generations to build and which necessarily transcended the lifespan of its builders was, however solid or potentially permanent, adapted and transformed according to incidental needs. To destroy such cities and buildings after having used them so successfully and for so long would seem as absurd and superfluous as to destroy a cup after having tasted from it. Cedric Price Interaction Center in Camden, London, probably represents an unnecessary tough statement to the contrary. The image of industrial bricolage reminds one painfully of the sinister compilation of military camps and detention centers in Northern Ireland, which are a most authentic realization of an industrial zeitgeist in all their ephemeral brutality and kitsch toughness. It will be no surprise if the useless waste of this public building cost more than its equivalent in stone and marble. In this apocalyptic dawn, crowded with quietly fading meteorites, a reformation of architecture based on its own rational principles would seem to be a daring enterprise, if it was not of such an excruciating necessity, and if it was not part of a collective striving. In the light of fast-changing fashions, Whale and Terry's hat reconstruction after William Chambers stands out as a heroic, pleasurable and wise restatement of the essential elements of architecture. It is an encyclopedist vision of what building might have been before it became an art, before the discovery of bronze and before its translation into stone. Now that we are in a period where architecture and building is vanishing from the face of the earth like an underground stream, this little sturdy structure must be, and should be, a slap in the ideological face of that generation who thought that they had killed architecture once and for all. As such, it gives me a great pleasure and I take it as a lesson. You cannot plunge in at a deep end. You cannot slap Corinthian columns onto reinforced concrete buildings and call it architecture. It is something much more fundamental. It is this something much more fundamental which a new generation of architects, activists, historians, artisans and artists are fighting for at many different levels. As this something more fundamental can certainly not be acquired in an absurd educational machinery nor by scientific investigation or in professional offices and institutions, it has to be discovered in the field or in the documents that remain of pre-industrial European civilization. The complex social, cultural and economical fabric still leaves enough traces to be investigated, not in an art historical sense to clarify and store away, but to elaborate the instruments of a new urban artisan culture. This cannot be news from nowhere, and it is only in an urban society that any large-scale resistance to industrialization is still possible. Virtually all large-scale building operations of the last 30 years will have to be condemned. They are inhuman, inefficient, ugly, badly built and costly to police. These human deserts will have to become the main concern of future interventions. Not only have they destroyed parts of lively urban centers, but they are also in need of technical and social repair. They need, so to speak, to be dezoned and re-urbanized. If our attitude to history and culture has to change, it must first of all get away from teaching cultural and political history as a series of apocalyptic breaks, as a series of points of no return. What we want is to add to our wealth without diminishing our pleasure. Formal education, from having been the pleasurable privilege of a few, has become the tortuous necessity for all. Manual work, which was the basis for human creativity and self-realization, has, through industrial and social division of labor, become a stultifying and socially a degrading exercise. All my life I have been waiting for the revival of architecture. 
I do not think it will happen, but if the right idea could be put out at the right time, I think it would happen. How wonderful it would be. The world could be beautiful again, and nothing but a blind spot really stops it. Some people are about to keep alive a little awareness, memory and intelligence in an age where under the joint banners of education, efficiency and security, the memory and faculties of what we know as humanity are systematically drowned in the immensity of entertaining stupidity on one hand, brutality and destruction on the other, where, without restriction, can nowhere be anything produced of importance. A humanity whose end is no longer the pursuit of pleasure, but the omnipresence of necessity, must find, ironically, the only pleasure in its own destruction, in the recognition of its ultimate uselessness. A state of pleasure is also one of contemplation of one's own being and doing. Narcissus is calm and holds his breath so as not to confuse the reflection of his own beauty. Now, if being and doing are but mere necessity, the moment of contemplation has changed from being one of satisfaction to become one of urgency. In that perspective, the meticulous self-destruction of humanity becomes obviously a moment of relief. A relief from unbearable urgency, ugliness and futile agony.